Welcome back to Science for Skeptics. We've been working our way through the concept of relative density as a potential replacement for gravity. And tonight, we're going to extend what we've learned so far to embrace what happens when our whole system is under some kind of acceleration. Let's recap for those who are just now joining us. This is our equation for the law of relative density. What this allows us to do is predict the weight or buoyancy of any object based on its density relative to the density of the medium it is in. Now, if this equation comes out as a positive number, that means we get a weight for that object. The object sinks. If this uh, subtraction becomes negative, then we'll get a buoyancy. We'll get a negative weight which I am using as buoyancy, right? That means that object is going to float. Now, some people have asked about this, and let me be very clear. This equation doesn't just say whether you will sink or float. It will say how hard you're going to sink and how hard you're going to pull if you float. This weight value here will be measured in uh, units of force. We've been using grams of force. And so that tells us if you drop a rock into some water, you fill in the rock's density, you fill in the, the, rock, uh, the water's density, you fill in the rock's volume, that will tell you how much that rock pushes down when it hits the bottom of the water. When, you know, if you put a scale into the water, how hard that rock pushes down at the bottom. Or, if you put helium's density and air's density, put the volume of your balloon, this number will tell you how hard that balloon pulls up. So this is a quantity that is that specifically tells you not just if it's up or down, but how hard. Now, a few people have been a little confused about my definition of the word weight. Let me remind you, back in video number one, I presented this slide where I contained my definition for weight, which may not match the definition you find in your physics textbook. Words sometimes have multiple definitions, and many textbooks have the gravitational definition of weight listed, which defines weight specifically based on gravity. Now, we are doing investigations of gravity specifically questioning whether gravity maybe doesn't even exist. In that case, a definition of weight based on gravity would be circular and inappropriate for our discussions. Instead, I choose a much more intuitive definition of weight, where I simply am going to define weight as the number you read off of the scale. The amount of force exerted on the scale is your weight and that can have numerous different, possibly even unknown, contributing factors. So did I just make up this new definition of weight? No, I did not. Uh, the definition I choose to use for weight is called the operational definition, uh, learn to spell, eh, it'll fix it for me, weight. Operational definition of weight. Uh, there we go, operational definition of weight. And you can check out right here from this link, it'll explain it in there. Um, or we could go straight to Wikipedia, that's, that's good. The operational definition of weight is right here. And you can see right on the Wikipedia page that there are multiple definitions of the word weight, which is one of the reasons why uh, when someone makes uh, an argument based on the definition of a word, that should be an immediate red flag that we may have a problem here because words often have multiple meanings. Sometimes they have very specific meanings in certain contexts. Sometimes they may be used colloquially to mean, you know, uh, just the way people commonly talk. I would argue the way people commonly talk in terms of weight is using the operational definition and let's look at it right here. Uh, the weight of the object is the force measured by the operation of weighing it. Simple as that. Means nothing more than that. Nothing more, nothing less. You put it on a scale, the number on the scale is the operational weight. 
Because we're describing weight in this way, the concept of being weightless follows naturally from that. In this example, the people in the aircraft will be experiencing a moment of weightlessness as the aircraft goes into a dive. By accelerating downward towards the ground, the aircraft can be made to simulate a weightless environment where everything becomes neutrally buoyant. Oh my God. The people oh will my no God. longer be held to the ground oh and the helium balloon will no longer be uh, pulling taut against the string. Oh but watch what happens wow. right here. Wow. As Whoa. all the people Whoa. are drifting in a particular direction at the same time. Let's watch that again Whoa. and keep your eyes on what the helium balloon does during that same drift. As the people are drifting to the left, the helium balloon is drifting to the right. They're moving in opposite directions. So does the zero-g plane prove that density has nothing to do with this? Quite the contrary. What we saw was that when the pilot went into the dive and established zero-g, everything became neutral, whether it was lighter than air or heavier. But it, when the pilot accelerated a little bit more, we saw that the people, heavier than air, were thrown upwards towards the ceiling, while the lighter than air balloon was thrown down towards the floor. So what does that mean in terms of this equation, our law of relative density? Well, what we saw was that the reaction of the objects was still driven by the difference in density. But by accelerating upward or downward, the pilot was able to somehow modify this k vector. Remember, we measured the k vector. We found in our own kitchens that we got 1.0 grams of force per gram of mass. But what we saw in the flight was that when the pilot went into the dive, accelerating downward, if we were to measure k in that situation, we would have gotten zero. And then there was a point when it got even less than zero, that k became a negative value. It looked like a very small negative value, which caused the helium balloon to be driven downward while the people were driven upward, moving in opposite directions. So the equation still holds, but we learned something. We learned that this k constant isn't quite constant, is it? It can be affected by an acceleration. And we learned a little something else. You'll recall from the previous video that we had discovered that this k vector carries with it the direction of down, that something in nature wants heavy objects to be pulled downward, and that direction down does not come from the density. It does not come from the relative density. We saw that during this zero g flight when objects started moving sideways. The sideways motion was correlated between the heavy objects and the light objects, indicating this subtraction is still at work. The relative density still existed and it still caused a reaction between those objects. But the way the plane was flying caused this k vector to change direction. And that is how we know for certain that density itself is not a vector. Density does not have a direction to it. The relative density was still clearly a factor across all of these experiments, whether, they, whether the density pulls the object down or in fact, even to the side as we saw in that flight. The only way to make that happen is if there was an external influence that carried with it the direction. I said I was going to focus on empirical science that we can verify ourselves. And it is unlikely that any of us are going to be invited on the zero G plane anytime soon, but we can do a similar experiment on our own using a helium balloon that you can get from the party store and a car or van, you can accelerate the car and observe what happens with the helium balloon. All the denser than air objects move against the acceleration of the vehicle. When you accelerate, you feel yourself pulled back in the seat and the heavier than air balloon will move backward. But the lighter than air balloon, the helium balloon 
moves forward as the, as the car accelerates. Let's turn this into a little experiment that we could do ourselves. Get yourself a van and a helium balloon. Install an accelerometer app like this one on your phone. Get yourself a protractor and you'll need a second camera. Because we're using the phone for the accelerometer, we'll need something that we can uh, film video with, either another phone or um, just a, a standalone camera. Just like we saw in the video, we're going to tie the helium balloon to the bottom of the car. But to make things a little bit more scientific, let's set up a protractor so that we can measure the angle that the string is at and also set up that accelerometer where it's in view of the camera. As the driver is driving in a nice steady straight line, we should see the balloon hanging straight up on the protractor and our accelerometer should show one G of acceleration pointing downward and nothing side to side or front to back. Now the driver accelerates and we see the balloon tilt forward. We'll be looking for the angle the balloon sets and we'll also be looking for the accelerometer's reading at that time. Hit the brakes and measure that angle and also make sure you capture the accelerometer there. Just like you saw in the video, we're expecting to see that the helium balloon moves with the acceleration of the car, whereas anything heavier than air, denser than air, moves against the acceleration of the car, showing that the relative density is crucial to determining which way the object moves. Our hypothesis is that the K vector has been affected by the acceleration of the car. To show that, we're going to try to correlate the angle of the balloon string against the accelerometer's reading. We can do this without even using trigonometry. We will just plot the accelerations on a piece of paper using a ruler scale and measure that out. Take the vertical acceleration from your accelerometer and plot that as a vertical line on your paper. Use a ruler to set a scale value that makes sense for the size of paper you have. We're expecting a, a vertical acceleration of about 1g, so that will establish the scale of your diagram. Now, uh, read the horizontal, the forward-back acceleration from the accelerometer and plot an, a horizontal line starting from the end of your vertical line that is at that same scale. This creates an angle. Simply connect the tail of the first line to the head of the second line and use your protractor to measure the angle. Our hypothesis is that the angle of the accelerations will match the angle you saw in the video that the balloon was hanging at. I think what you're going to find is that the accelerometer on the phone measured a horizontal and a vertical acceleration that very closely approximates the angle that the balloon was held at. What does this tell us? This tells us that the direction of the K vector is directly influenced by the acceleration of the vehicle. Let's recap everything we've learned so far. First, we started in the kitchen where we measured the, the weight of different objects in different mediums and found that the weight seems to be affected by the difference between the density of the object and the density of the medium that it's in. Objects that are less dense than their medium will have a negative difference and therefore end up with a negative weight, also known as buoyancy. Today, we've extended that to realize that we can make objects move in other directions by accelerating the medium. And when we do that, the relative density difference is still a critical factor. This tells us that the effective weight of an object doesn't just point up and down. If we're in an accelerated medium, a buoyant object will move with the acceleration, while a, a heavy object will move against the acceleration. This tells us that it is not inherently the density that contains the direction down. It is that external factor K that we measured from nature that contains the inherent down. By diving or climbing in an aircraft, we can raise or lower the value of K. And by accelerating forward and back in a car, we can change the direction of K. 
So what does this mean for relative density? This means clearly that the relative density as a subtraction is a critical factor in determining the weight of an object as well as how it reacts to accelerations. But the direction that we get for the weight of an object is clearly independent of the relative density and must come from some external factor from nature. If you're still with me after all this, we now need to investigate deeper the source of this k vector and its direction. We've found that the k vector can be influenced by accelerations, but what about when we're standing still? When we're standing still, we got a direction of straight down, and we have now shown that that down must be part of the k vector. So that is where we need to dig deeper if we want to find the source of this down direction.